everybody, Zach again, NewsTutorial.com, coming in making a video for you today. Um, a few days ago, Lex Meyer put out a video uh, talking about Passover and specifically talking about my view on Passover and the Last Supper and was it a Passover meal. I have done videos on this in the past. I give four clear reasons why I believe that it was not a Passover meal. Um, other people have done amazing videos that breaks breaks these uh, ideas and points down. Steve Berkson is another great one. If you're interested in diving into this deeper, I highly suggest you go check out Steve Berkson's videos, and I'll put them in the description below. Um, he does a two-part series on this. He, like I said, breaks it down in great detail. And um, I'm of the belief that the Last Supper, uh, as described as we know about in Christianity, or as they call it in Christianity, is not the Passover meal. He's not having a Passover meal. He says, I greatly desire to have this Passover with you. Uh, the problem is he's not going to do that. He re really wanted to. But he's trying to, he has been trying to explain to his, 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 his disciples for a long time now that he's going to die. And they're all like, no, you're not. No, you're not. And they just can't get it through their head. And what he's doing here is he's saying, listen, I'm the Passover. He, and it's coming, it's, it's a revelation for them that he is the Passover. And, you know, what's, what does that signify? We're going to get, I have a whole other video planned for that, you know, coming up soon. Because there are people who are asking, Zach, you know, I'm trying to, explain the Passover of our Messiah and see it in the Old Testament and, you know, what significance, what, what role does this play in, um, in, in our faith? You know, how, how does that, how does that happen? You know, where is this, where is his sacrifice is, you know, and there are people out there now today saying human sacrifice is not allowed in the Bible. And I have absolutely argued against that. And I'm going to show you a number of examples in Torah where human sacrifice is absolutely allowed. But there are people out there who are like, no, human sacrifice, this isn't, this is, he's not the Messiah because human sacrifice isn't allowed in the Torah. It's absolutely incorrect. We're going to get a whole other video. But for this one, I'm going to double down and understand. You know, Lex contacted me, you know, before he ever did that video. He said, hey, listen, man, I want to do this video. I disagree with you on your findings. I used to agree with you, but now I disagree with you, and I just want to do a video on it. And I said, dude, go ahead, have fun. And, and then after he did the video, he called me up and said, hey, man, I just want to talk to you about this. Or he sent me an email. Is it, was it OK? And I said, yeah, absolutely. It's fine. You know, totally cool. Um, you know, we can disagree on things. I have lots of people I disagree with who I'm still friends with on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. OK, um, I can disagree with you and still be friends with you. I'm not going to defriend you, you know, over, you know, a disagreement uh, according to the scriptures uh, over your Bible. Um, now, that out of the way, I still disagree. <laughs> and I can disagree passionately um, and give you my reasons and even raise my voice. You know, it doesn't mean I hate you, um, but I disagree. Four reasons why, you know, uh, he, it was not a Passover meal. I give those reasons in that video that Lex mentioned. I'll also include that in the description below, that original video. But here's the deal. After Lex's video, I had a number of people come to me and say, yeah, Zach, I mean, he makes a lot of good points. You know, what do you think about that? Or people came to me and said, Zach, you know, I, you know, he may have a good video, but I, I'm still not buying it. I still have problems with this, this and this. Um, but people were all over the board on that, I think. And so, um, I, I, again, I have issues with they left. Judas gets up and leaves. And the disciples, according to those verses, says they think he's going to go buy something for the feast hasn't started yet. If it was their Passover, why is he going out and buying something? Because if it's really their Passover, even if there's two separate Passovers, um, you know, for, for different religious groups, uh, it's their Passover. You're not going to go out and buy something. The store should be closed at that time anyway. You should have your stuff squared away by then. You know, and it's very clear. They said, you know, where are we going to go to make the Passover? It says it's the day of the Passover, and they still don't know where they're going to go yet. Also, keep in mind, Luke and Mark, the Synoptic Gospels, two of them, they, neither of these two guys were eyewitnesses to this event anyway. So they're telling the story. And so they're just they're putting in as much of the story as they know because they weren't there. It wasn't, it wasn't a Passover because, number one, they get up and leave. They all get up and go. Okay, not according to Exodus 12, chapter, tw uh, chapter 12, verse 22, you're supposed to stay inside till morning. Do not leave the house. And they got up and they left. Okay, that's still tradition today. It's not tradition back then. It's commanded in Torah, Exodus chapter 12, verse 22. The same verse where it says to put the blood on the doorpost. Well, Lex, when I talked to him on the phone, says, well, you still do that? I said, yeah, we do. Because in, in Numbers chapter 9, it says to keep the Passover with all the rites and the ceremonies thereof. This is future Passovers. 
This is not, this is after Egypt. Keep the Passover with all the rites and ceremonies. Well, my friends, the only place you're going to find the rites and the ceremonies as spelled out in the Torah is in Exodus chapter 12. And that includes verse 22. Stay inside till morning. They did not do that. They got up and they left. There's no mention of a Passover lamb. The lamb, the purchase of the lamb, the preparation of the lamb, the butchering of the lamb, and there's sure as shooting, not any mention of the burning of the lamb. Folks, we have been uh, butchering a lamb here for Passover on my property um, for the last, I think, four years now. The first year I did that here, um, I made a, a logistical error. I, I did not have enough wood uh, for that fire because it says you're supposed to burn the lamb up until morning. There's nothing left. Well, I put some wood on the fire and I thought I was good. And so um, I went out there the next morning and there's bones there in the, in the ashes. There's half a horn. There's part of the hide. It takes a lot of wood, you know, to burn up a body, you know, to burn up the carcass of the lamb. It says to burn it so that there's nothing left till morning. If you're going to do that, you are not going to leave and go out, you know, in the garden to pray. It, it never mentions anything about burning up the lamb, burning up the carcass. That ta- it, Every year I do this, it takes me usually till midnight. I'm putting fire, continually putting wood on that fire until midnight, till I'm satisfied. I've got enough wood on that fire to burn up that carcass. You just don't willy-nilly leave it. You can't because you're not going to burn it up. There, there'll be bones and there'll be, you know, a horn left over or, you know, part of a hide or something left over if you do not tend to that fire and make sure it's burning. I mean, there, I mean, people rarely think of the logistics. Yeah, that's another thing too, folks. And I asked Lex, I asked, I said, you know, how many lambs have you butchered? He, he doesn't do that. He's never done that before. You know, and there's a lot of folks I know I talk to, they've never butchered their own animals before. You know, they don't know what it takes to, to burn up a carcass. There's a lot involved with that. And when you think about the, the sacrifices that took place in the temple, it was a logistical hurdle to, to match, to be able to get all that firewood, to be able to keep that thing going day and night. It says the fire was never to go out, folks. It's a, it took a lot of wood. You know, maybe that's why there's no trees in the Middle East today. I mean, I, I don't think that's the reason. I think it's because, you know, God cursed the land. But um, you have to think about it. That's a lot of wood. And so there's no mention of that in that in that meal, in the Gospels. There's no mention of the burning of the lamb, and that's a, that's an issue for me. So all the reasons I gave before, uh, those reasons there, and here's the nail in the coffin, my friends. At least for me, you know, the fact that they got up, you know, that's that's a big deal, and all the other reasons I gave in the past in that video that's linked in the description below. Um, there's no mention in Scripture anywhere in the New Testament or anywhere in the Old Testament, you know, uh, in the prophets of any sort of disagreement between different Jewish religious sects, whether it's the Pharisees, Sadducees, or Essenes, or anybody else, and as anybody else, of different Passovers. You know, there was all kinds of disagreements on circumcision and all kinds of other, you know, man-made traditions, you know, oral traditions that went against the Torah. But there's no mention anywhere in Scripture of two different Passovers between two different religious groups. So Lex, his whole argument, and many others who, who go along with this, is pivotal on there being two different Passovers by different religious groups during that time. Because you have John chapter 13, where they're keeping this meal, and then John chapter 18, the next day, where the Jews are not about to go into the Roman Hall of Judgment because they don't want to be defiled for Passover because it hasn't happened yet. They would have to keep the second Passover. They don't want to do that. Passover hasn't happened yet in John chapter 18. So your, your whole argument is based on there being two different Passovers. Folks, show me somewhere in your Bible, in your New Testament, where they're disagreeing on which is the right Passover. When they're trying to tell these new believers coming in, you know, from the Gentiles and other Jews, you know, who are followers of Messiah, that, the, you know, there's a right and a wrong Passover to keep. I don't see it. I don't see any argument whatsoever. And I haven't seen yet, and I've looked, you know, extra biblical writings of there being two separate Passovers between two different religious groups. Show me the money, so to speak. Show me where it's at. Um, But really, where's my ultimate authority is the Bible. You know, where is it in the scriptures? Where is it in the New Testament? Where is it anywhere in the prophets that there are two separate religious groups keeping two different Passovers? I can't find it. And that's where where your uh, argument is hinged on. 
and I and I'm not you know I'm not there. So um, again, we can get along. I can be friends with you. You can have. Hey, listen, I'm doing my Passover Monday night. You know, and I rarely tell people when I'm doing my Passover because I know it's a hot button topic. People get upset. People get you know they, they want to make sure they're doing this right. And I totally get why because we've been doing we've spent our whole lives doing things wrong, and now we want to get things right. You know. What we need to be careful of, my friends, is because someone does something a different way, not to belittle them or bash them over the head with our way or how we think we're doing it right. Um, and I think Lex did a great job of, of doing that, you know, in respect and, 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 you know, not trying to disrespect anyone, including me or anybody else who does it a different way. He's just giving his opinion on how he thinks it's right. And I think that's great. That's what we all need to do. You know, I disagree with them. I'm going to do it the way I think is right. And, you know, one day, here's the deal, folks. Here's the bottom line. There's a bottom line in all of this. The bottom line is that when our, when our creator took his people out of Egypt, one of the first things he did, Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, is he reset the calendar. He reset the calendar. And so I got friends. I have friends I have friendly debates and passionate debates about the calendar and, you know, sliver versus conjunction versus Enoch versus all kinds of different ways. There's just more ways than I can count right now on how to keep the calendar. And some people really get frustrated over this. But let not your little heart be troubled. Because when he, when the greater exodus happens and our creator once again brings his people out of all of these lands, out of Egypt, and brings us back to the land he gave, he promised to Jacob, he's going to reset the calendar. We're all going to be on the same page. So what I would suggest until that time happens is try your best. Try your best to be obedient to his commands. And if you find someone who doesn't keep it exactly like you do, you know, it's okay. You know, breathe easy. Don't get emotional about it. <laughs> you know, maybe try to ask them and understand better why they do it. And if you, if you, if you feel like you want, that's a better way and that, you know, that person has more understanding than you, then switch. You know, you're trying your best. And see, right now, our father is looking down in the springtime. And he sees all these other people doing pagan things that were based in pagan idolatry, fertility, springtime worship, you know, to celebrate, um, you know, his son. And he's not happy with that. But in the meantime, he's bringing out thousands of people to understand the feast, his feast, you know. And uh, he's looking down at his kids and saying, aha, in the springtime, they're trying. They're, there's, there's my kids trying to be obedient. In the fall time, he looks down on, on, on his people in the fall, and they're keeping the Feast of Tabernacles, and he's saying, ah, there's my kids. They're trying to be obedient. They're doing something other than what their ancestors who came before them would not do. So that's the bottom line. He's going to reset the calendar. So um, anyway... Hope you have a great Passover. Hope you have a great unleavened bread. Enjoy it. Rejoice in it. And um, I know we're going to do the same thing here. It's going to be a great time. I have a couple of sheep that we're going to bu be butchering for unleavened bread. So we're going to be eating really good around here. And uh, we have a lamb for Passover. It's gonna be, every year we roast it over the fire. It's going to be great. Uh, they're calling for rain for our forecast for Passover. So um uh, but we have an indoor kitchen now uh, on our off-grid homestead that we're going to be butchering it or, or roasting it under. So the rain shouldn't put a damper on it like it has in years past. Uh, so uh, looking forward to all that. Hope you guys have a great Passover. Enjoy it. Uh, shalom and have a great feast. See you next time. Uh, oh, that's my ending for homestead. Go home, read your Bible. All right, thanks. Bye.